So hi guys. Uh, uh, today our speaker is uh, Professor S. Frem Kumar from Swansea University. He's going to talk about island space curves and boundary conformality theories. Uh, this is the 104th talk in the series. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Prem, for uh, agreeing to give this talk, and uh, uh, we are welcoming you to start. So you can start from your end. Yeah, th thank you, Shayanton, for inviting me, and uh, I'm very happy to give this talk um, to, to this audience. So as I understand, it's fairly an informal, so we can keep it informal. You're free, feel free to interrupt uh, with questions when, when you feel like it. Uh, so uh, as uh, Shayanton had uh, kind of stressed to me that this is supposed to be an informal meeting with PhD students and postdocs, and uh, I should go through some basic material to build up things. Um, uh, so I have included some very basic material. Maybe some of these things will be quite obvious to you. So, and, and very well understood or very well known to, to you guys. But in case, uh, sorry if it's, if it's very familiar material, but if it's not, feel free to ask questions. But then um, there is also some material here, which is based on more recent work with, uh, with my collaborators, uh, Tim Hollywood, uh, and postdoc Andrea Legramandi and Neil Talwar, who's a, who's a PhD student at, uh, at Swansea. So, okay, so the, the talk is about uh, the, the black hole island paradigm and page curves and the relationship in particular to boundary conformal field theory. So this is something that I will try to sketch as we go along. Maybe I'll get there beyond the halfway point of the talk. And there, uh, I'll try to kind of sketch what the picture is, the relationship between uh, black holes and islands and uh, corresponding objects in conformal field theory with the boundary. And then we'll present some calculations and then we'll try and understand how things that are seen in boundary conformal field theory language actually manifest themselves in the black hole picture, in the picture of black holes. Okay, so to begin with, I mean, this is now, uh, a very popular topic of study in recent years, in the especially the last couple of years. Uh, we know that black holes process information. They are quantum information processes. And in particular, if we imagine making a black hole out of collapsing uh, quantum matter prepared in some pure state at some initial time, and we make it undergo collapse, we know that if it forms a black hole, Hawking's calculation tells us the black hole uh, will undergo evaporation by the Hawking process and which produces Hawking radiation, which we will continuously, which we'll, which we'll call capital R. And, and when the black hole has completed evaporation and it's gone, uh, all we are left with is this Hawking radiation R and quantum mechanics basically tells us that this Hawking radiation R should be in a pure state which means that any entropy associated to this state should be vanishing. Now, uh, the reason there was an information puzzle was because the calculation of Hawking's basically told us that the radiation was thermal, coming out from the black hole was thermal uh, with no correlations, at least no short time correlations. And that then tells us that if we compute the naive entropy of this radiation, which is basically thermal entropy of the radiation, this obviously will grow without bound in the sense that it will keep growing until the black hole is, uh, has completely evaporated, leaving us with a final state a radiation which has a large entropy. And this, of course, is inconsistent with um, unitary time evolution and hence the information puzzle, which was enunciated by Hawking in 76. This is, of course, a semi classical picture where we are thinking about the Hawking radiation as. Uh, being emitted through the semi-classical process of Hawking radiation. Uh, and um, uh, as the years went by, there were many different uh, potential explanations for how unitarity could be restored. Uh, but of course, in recent times, well, before we get to the recent developments, the most clear enunciation of this 
puzzle comes in the form of the page curve and this was uh, this enunciation of the information puzzle was proposed by Don Page in 1993 and following papers and uh, what we are instructed to do is we should think actually about the von Neumann entropy uh, often called the entanglement entropy so since we have if we think about the Hawking radiation and the black hole system as a closed system, then uh, the Hawking radiation modes should be entangled with degrees of freedom behind the horizon of the black hole. And uh, this entanglement or the degree of the entanglement has to be characterized by an associated entropy, which is the entanglement entropy of the von Neumann entropy. The von Neumann entropy is defined like so, as is fairly well known where rho is the density matrix or the reduced density matrix of the Hawking radiation. So if you can compute rho sub r and you can compute trace rho log rho, then you have access to the, you can compute the von Neumann entropy. Now this is of course a very hard, uh, you know, problem to do in general, uh, but uh, Page provided a very general argument for what the von Neumann entropy should do as a function of time the von Neumann entropy of the radiation, how it should behave as a function of time. And it's based on very general arguments, quantum information arguments. And basically the first thing that we can tell is that the von Neumann entropy of the radiation at time t equals to zero has to be zero because there is no radiation. And we know that the von Neumann entropy of the radiation at late times also must vanish if quantum mechanics and unitarity hold because the final radiation is, has to be in a pure state obtained by unitary time evolution of the initial state. So that means at late times, the von Neumann entropy has to vanish. At early times, it must be vanishingly small. And therefore the curve that for the von Neumann entropy as a function of time must be non-monotonic. And on general grounds, you can say that at early times, the entropy of the radiation, which should look, which looks thermal-like, thermal at early times, it grows linearly, something happens. There is a turnaround period and there is late time radiation. But the late time radiation, uh, at late times, the von Neumann entropy of the radiation has to come necessarily come down. Uh, and the turnover point where the crossover point where this occurs is the page time. As we'll see in a little bit, this page time is a macroscopic time scale. It is not a time scale which is, well, it's not, T page is not close to the evaporation time, to be more precise. And uh, and we will we'll look at this. Uh, so, like uh, at the page time, what exactly happens so that it, uh, the turnaround take, takes place? Right. So the the point is that uh, so in this intuitive picture, right? We'll see in a little bit again more precisely this uh, pages argument in a little. We'll just come to it, come back to it in a little bit more detail. But the basic point is that at early times, on short time scales, there are no correlations. The correlations start building up beyond this page time, and that's it's because you. So, in other words, if you pick an uh, pick, if you pick a random Hawking mode at early times, you can ask, well, when does its purifier, uh, you know, enter the Hawking radiation bath? And that happens only at late times. So basically, the purification process starts at the page time. That's, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, essential picture of this, this picture, this general qualitative picture of the page curve basically tells us, uh, we'll see in a bit that there is no reason why this page curve should look symmetric. Although in this picture, the way I've drawn it is look symmetric. Um, in general, it will be, you know, some asymmetric looking curve as we'll see in a bit. So uh, the basic lesson here, like we already just said, is that the early and late Hawking radiation modes are actually correlated. And, and if you pick a particular late mode, Hawking mode B, it's going to be maximally entangled with some subset of the early modes, which we can call R sub B. So B and R sub B. Uh, but uh, we also know that this late, th that any given mode B is maximally entangled with the partner mode A behind the horizon. So 
I've just described to you the page curve and the page curve requires that late and early modes be correlated. But we also know from the Hawking process itself that any Hawking mode B, any given Hawking mode B is maximally entangled with a partner mode A behind the horizon. And this is so because the Hawking process can simply be thought of as the unruh effect at the horizon. So at the horizon, you have a Hawking mode B and its corresponding partner mode A. These two together are in effectively in a pure state and in the unruh effect basically tells us that when we trace over the degrees of freedom behind the horizon, we, we get something that looks like thermal radiation uh, from the outside, on, on this side. So the Hawking process is the unruh effect and that tells us that partner mode B must also be maximally entangled with A. So what I'm trying to describe here is the notion of the page curve, which assumes unitarity. It basically requires that late and early uh, Hawking modes be correlated, but the Hawking process itself requires that any given Hawking mode B be correlated with something else behind the horizon. And uh, general results uh, in quantum information tell us that this cannot be. A given mode cannot be maximally entangled with two different other systems. And this is the monogamy of entanglement. So there are actually, in a sense, two puzzles. Uh, there is the basic information puzzle and uh, which is exactly how this page curve gets turned around. But there's also this other puzzle. If there is such a turnaround in the page curve, which means late and early modes are correlated, then you also have to start worrying about what happens to these correlations. You know, How do you understand that there is also supposed to be a maximal correlation between these modes B and A across the horizon? So there are two, in effect, there are two kind of, there are two puzzles, not just one. Uh, and so it turns out that there is, uh, you know, one stone that manages to kill uh, two birds, if for want of a better analogy. So both these puzzles can be resolved. Number one, if this mode, Hawking mode, if this partner mode A behind the horizon, somehow, uh, for some miraculous reason, is actually to be identified with R sub B. Remember that in this notation, which I've just introduced, uh, late Hawking mode B is maximally entangled with some early, early set of Hawking modes R sub B. So B is entangled with maximally entangled with partner mode across the horizon, but it's also maximally entangled with R sub B. And this monogamy of entanglement problem is avoided if by, for some miraculous reason, A and RB get identified. In other words, modes behind the horizon in the hill are actually lie in the Hilbert space of the early Hawking radiation. So this proposal was actually made, uh, I think by more than one people, but it appears in Harlow's works in 2014. So um, then, uh, you know, this picture- I have one of, question. Sorry, yes. I have one question. So this, yeah. uh, so how do you know this, uh, the, uh, the I mean, I understand that they are just correlated, but how do you know that they are maximally entangled? Because this monogamy of entanglement holds if there is maximally entangled, right? Yeah, that's right. So the point is that you can pick, you know, so uh, for the unruh effect, we know that modes A and B are maximally entangled, right? And uh, for the Hawking process, you can, ident you can identify any, you can pick any Hawking quantum at, uh, at late times. Hawking mm -hmm. mode, the quantum of Hawking radiation. And we know that it will be maximally entangled with a set of modes RB at, at, at early times. And the reason we know this is because there are no short term correlations in the Hawking radiation. That is, so uh, if you look at the Hawking radiation coming, there is no, there is mm -hmm. no correlation between successive quanta. So that is actually one of the characteristic features that there are no short term correlations. So you I might have thought like, for example, what if the correlation is distributed across, mm -hmm. right, or non-locally, or both at early. And the key point is that early modes are uncorrelated with any of the early modes, and, and the same with the late modes. So it's early and late that share correlations. Yes. Uh, this, of course, is also seen, can be seen uh, subsequently by doing calculations within this island framework as well. It's the self-consistency check. Okay, thank you. So uh, 
yeah so now both these so the, killing these both these birds with one stone uh, was achieved in this replica calculation which i will not uh, describe because that takes me away but the replica calculation which many of you must have heard about which was um, done in order to compute uh, the reduced density sorry in order to compute the von neumann entropy uh, the replica calculation done in semi classical gravity particular semi classical euclidean gravity uh, it showed that there are actually two contributions to the gravitational partition function when you do the replica trick and one of the contributions is the standard what we call the standard black hole saddle point and the other contribution is what we call the replica wormhole saddle point and the replica wormhole saddle point precisely realizes this a equals rb scenario and at the same time it also reproduces the page curve and the page curve is reproduced because the entanglement entropy of the radiation is not computed computed now any more in the standard field theoretic language because of the semi classical gravity effects from the new saddle point you are instructed the, the there is a non trivial modification in the entanglement entropy and it turns out that you have to include the degrees of freedom behind the horizon which seems natural now if there is a realization of this scenario a equals rb so the fact that you know there are degrees of freedom behind the horizon that must now be included in the exterior essentially resolves two things at the same time it resolves this monogamy of entanglement problem but it also helps to turn around the page curve okay so let's uh, just briefly review the what the just present what the formula for this generalized entropy is which uh, goes by the name of the island rule which is what we use when we compute the entanglement entropy of what of uh, hawking radiation the von neumann entropy so here's the formula and i'm sure you have seen this so uh, the generalized entropy or the fine grained entropy uh, this entropy consists of two pieces there is one piece that is reminiscent of the bekenstein hawking entropy uh and there's a second piece that is basically the radiation entropy or the entropy that you would compute or the von neumann entropy you would compute using qft techniques standard qft techniques except what you are instructed to do is that to compute the von neumann entropy of the radiation r you're instructed to actually consider unions of r with regions i and these regions i are the island regions which are mostly behind the horizon but they don't not completely but largely behind the horizon you are instructed to include these islands and you instructed to then consider the generalized entropy which is s radiation of r union i plus the bekenstein hawking like term which is evaluated at the boundaries of these islands the boundaries of the islands are the quantum extremal surfaces and you then instructed to extremize this functional for all choices of i and it's the extremal value that you then pick out as the correct entropy or the von neumann entropy of the radiation so what's the upshot of this kind of picture well at early times this is a picture okay again a cartoon of the hawking process so you have hawking radiation r and its unru partners behind the horizon so these are the purifiers of the hawking radiation r what happens is this is the early time picture at late times for an old black hole when you come when you look at the von neumann entropy of the radiation you actually have to include these island regions which largely live behind the horizon and the islands become part of the exterior so you have to compute the radiation entropy or sorry the qft the entanglement entropy computed using qft methods of not just r but r union i so in some sense i becomes part of the exterior and so that means that the islands as they collect the purifiers of r they purify the hawking radiation and therefore they turn around the page curve so there are two things happening the island regions are identified behind the horizon and they then collect the purifiers of the hawking radiation and since i is now in principle by this recipe included on the outside 
uh, you get a purification of the radiation and the page curve, page curve begins to turn around. So the purifier of the radiation is collected in the islands. Or in other words, another way of saying this is that the islands are in the entanglement wedge of the radiation. So this exchange between this early time picture and the late time picture is the exchange between Hawking saddle and the island saddle, the no island saddle and the island saddle. And it is this exchange that helps us understand the turnaround of the page curve. So uh, are there any questions about this? I am probably going through stuff that is quite familiar to people. Any questions, class? Otherwise, we will move to the next. Okay, so uh, there are several interesting questions one can ask, and these are all questions now within this, given this recipe of the generalized entropy and this island framework, uh, one can ask many different kinds of interesting questions. For example, you can ask questions like, supposing I pick uh, some late Hawking mode B emitted at some late time intervals after the turnaround of the page curve, you can ask, how is it correlated with the early modes? So in other words, can you pin down the subset of the early Hawking radiation, which is the purifier of the late modes? So it's interesting, if you do this exercise, you will discover that actually the late, the correlations of the late mode are actually non-locally spread around the early modes. Um, and in fact, vice versa. So um, another interesting question you can ask, a real time question is, for example, how is information which is thrown into the black hole, like in the form of a diary, this is the so-called uh, Hayden Preskill protocol. You throw the diary and how do you recover this information from the, uh, this, this diary from the Hawking radiation? And, and, and so you can see, do all these toy experiments using, these, using this um, generalized entropy. And you can ask, you know, answer all these questions with precise quantitative uh, understanding of exactly what happens and when the information that you throw in can be retrieved. Um, for example, when the diary is thrown in a, a, into a young black hole, uh, if you throw in a diary, then basically you recover it only after the page time. Uh, uh, on the other hand, if you throw the diary into the black hole, uh, when the black hole is old, which means after the page time, the diary basically comes back immediately after a very short scrambling time. So the black hole effectively acts like a mirror for information uh, when it's old. So these are all interesting questions that you can ask and these generalized entropy framework applied to a specific uh, gravity model allows you to answer these kinds of questions quantitatively. Uh, kind of more deeper questions are, for example, how are the island degrees of freedom it's all well to say that you have this nice way to account for the entanglement entropy. After all, the turning around of the page curve is fixed by a kind of accounting problem. Uh, you, you, you basically manage to, by introducing the notion of these islands, which appear through these semi-classical wormhole saddles, you have essentially introduced um, a way to collect the purifiers of the Hawking radiation from behind the horizon. And, and what that's doing is basically turning the page curve around. Uh, but if you want to ask more dynamical questions, if the island is indeed part of the exterior, then uh, there must be some ways to understand how the island degrees of freedom behind the horizon are actually encoded in this Hawking radiation. If you perform some operate, if you operations on the island degrees of freedom, what does it correspond to on the Hawking radiation modes? So these are all interesting questions and you know, varying degrees of difficulty in terms of uh, using a given formalism to understand these, the answers to these questions. Okay, so that was the preamble uh, to this, to, to what I wanted to talk about. So first, here's the rough outline of the things that I will review in some detail now. So first I'll talk about the, um, you know, essentially what is pages derivation of page curve. And then uh, I'll move to the islands and page curves in JT gravity, which uh, you may be familiar 
is an effective one plus one dimensional reduction of higher dimensional gravity. And for reasons that you know, we'll briefly discuss, it is more convenient to work with this, uh, with this JT gravity framework. And in fact, it's more than sufficient to work with JT gravity to understand what is the mechanics of, uh, uh, of, of this information puzzle and its resolution. Uh, so in particular, I'll focus on some, some questions that involve the black hole in the hartle hawking state or the thermofield double state. And uh, then explore the connection of this system uh, to conformal field theory with the boundary. And then discuss how the island picture is related to what happens to these boundary conformal field theory correlation functions. So these are based on papers with collaborators here. This one is a recent paper. And then there are other questions that are also interesting that I don't think I will have the time uh, to talk about today. But these are where you can study uh, black holes in particularly interesting states. So you can look at this JT gravity framework. You can start from a zero temperature extremal state, and then you can throw in a shock wave, which creates a black hole. And the black hole then evaporates dynamically. The entire black hole formation and creation process can be understood analytically in JT gravity. And there's an exact background that describes this evolution in the semi-classical limit. And you can study all these kinds of questions about information retrieval, information recovery, page curve, and all those things for the you know, completely dynamical, real-time evaporating black holes. Uh, and so these are things that you can see in these earlier papers that we studied with, that we worked on with Tim Hollowood and uh, Andrea. Uh, refined measures of um, quantum correlations, computing mutual information, multiple intervals, things like that. Uh, things which give you more and more information about, um, about the correlations present in Hawking radiation. So there's lots of interesting things that one can try and study. Uh, so first, let me begin by you know, talking a little bit about something very basic, uh, which is, you know, which is um, going back to Page's argument uh, you know, so the basic argument was that Hawking radiation, which consists of modes emitted near the horizon via the unruh effect. Uh, if you look at Hawking radiation uh, and the Hawking radiation problem, uh, because the black hole, assuming that the black hole is spherically symmetric, for example, the Schwarzschild black hole or any other spherically symmetric Reissner Nordstrom type black hole, uh, in order to understand Hawking radiation emission by a black hole, one has to actually uh, decompose the radiation into spherical harmonics, the radiation field into spherical harmonics. And each of these harmonics, uh, they, they satisfy some wave equation in the black hole background. And the wave equation when cast in Schrodinger form has a, has a kind of repulsive potential, which means that the radiation uh, coming out from near the horizon uh, has to actually escape through escape to infinity, but it has to effectively pass, be transmitted through a barrier. So this barrier is responsible for the black hole gray body factors. So when you do this harmonic decomposition, decomposition you discover that different L harmonics of radiation have different transmission coefficients or transmission coefficients that switch on at different frequencies. And, and uh, essentially what this tells you by looking at the transmission coefficients, as the spherical harmonic number increases, as the L number increases, the, um, the transmission coefficients for the corresponding harmonics switch on, switch on at higher and higher frequencies. That means if you're interested in low frequencies, not ultra high frequencies, it suffices to focus attention on the S wave spherical harmonics which means it's enough to understand what's going on with the uh, L equals zero harmonic of the radiation field. Uh, and, and so uh, effectively this reduction to the S wave essentially tells us that all we need to do to understand you know, the details of the information puzzle, et cetera, is to first look at just the S wave, which, which achieves a reduction to an effective one plus one dimensional system. So we can think about this entire problem in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, Hawking radiation for the S waves. 
and and so we just focus attention on uh, on uh, one set of um, one set of modes and so the problem is reduced to the radial direction plus the time direction now the unruh effect or the hawking effect at the horizon tells us that the occupation numbers of the l equals zero harmonics is just given by the bose einstein factor 1 over e to the beta omega minus 1 now suppose we have uh, a certain number of massless degrees of freedom which means a certain number of massless species of particles and we call that c c from central charge then we are basically thinking about 1 plus c 1 plus 1 dimensional massless degrees of freedom and we want to take c to be large so that we can consistently in some kind of semi classical approximation um and we if we assume that the temperature of the black hole is slowly varying in other words one is working in an adiabatic approximation which is justified because the black hole evaporation is a slow process then we can say that any given time delta t in a given time increment delta t the radiation entropy gets incremented by an amount delta s rad which is equal to delta t times the entropy of a one dimensional uh, massless gas a gas of massless particles in one dimensions so that is the uh, that is standard result which you can either get from standard statistical mechanics or you can just get from your favorite conformal field theory uh, textbook so we'll tell you that the entropy goes like pi ct over pi c times the temperature over 6 and of course the temperature is a function of time and adiabaticity here plays an important role in in talking about this entropy so any given time delta t the entropy in the radiation increments by precisely this amount therefore the the entropy in the hawking radiation over time t is given by just integrating this expression uh, from 0 to t now if hawking radiation is being emitted by the black hole this tells us that there is a radiation flux which is escaping escaping the black hole and therefore the mass of the black hole must change such that dm dt is minus the radiation flux and the radiation flux again from uh, standard physics of uh, one dimensional gas we can compute this this is p squared over 12 times the central charge this is the usual result in cft for the expectation value of the stress tensor so dm dt m dot is equal to minus this quantity so now uh, what, what the other input that we need in order to solve this you know this semi classical problem uh, is to is to basically figure out how the mass of the black hole depends on the temperature so if we know what the black how the black mass of the black hole depends on the temperature we can solve for this different for the temperature using this differential equation we have a complete understanding of how the temperature of the black hole evolves as a function of time and then we can figure out how the entropy of the black hole evolves as a function of time using the bekenstein hawking result okay so two characteristic two uh, examples the schwarzschild black hole the mass is proportional to 1 over the temperature and that gives us the negative specific heat of the schwarzschild black hole uh, for near extremal black holes reissner nordstrom like black holes in the near extremal limit the mass is proportional to some m star which is a constant but the temperature dependence is quadratic and there's some coefficient here which can be viewed as the effective 1 plus 1 dimensional coupling constant in this 1 plus 1 dimensional effective theory of gravity which we also call gt1 okay so the constant is just some constant that is like an effective newton's constant or inverse effective newton's constant in jt gravity so here are here are two situations the schwarzschild black hole case and the jt gravity case uh, which is extremal which describes basically near extremal reissner nordstrom so here the temperature dependence is t squared plus a constant so either of these we can solve uh, we can plug it in here and solve for the temperature exactly and once we solve for the temperature we can also extract the um, bekenstein hawking entropy the time dependent bekenstein hawking entropy so for schwarzschild when you solve the differential equation you discover that the temperature the temperature of the black hole 
if you look at this formula, it tells us the temperature of the black hole decreases as a function of time. In fact, at time t equals t zero, this quantity diverges. So that is the evaporation time. So the Schwarzschild black hole evaporates at some finite time when the temperature becomes very large. In principle, diverging, but we should be careful because the semi-classical picture does not apply all the way towards the end of approximate uh, to the end of evaporation. And then the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy likewise has this kind of formula or this kind of dependence on the time, which tells us that the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy vanishes at the evaporation point, which makes sense because the black hole dis should disappear at that point uh, with the caveat that we shouldn't be trusting this very close to T equals T naught because again, semi-classical gravity should would, would fail to hold in that limit. So important point here is that the black hole entropy, the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy is a decreasing function of time. The radiation entropy, which you can compute by the previous uh, integral gives you a result which actually can be recast in a form that makes it look just like minus the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy with a factor of two. It just so happens that that's the way it is. So Page's argument is that the actual von Neumann entropy of the radiation is actually the minimum of these two things. And where this comes from is basically the, uh, the general consideration for large systems is that if you take a closed quantum system and divide it in two parts, A and B, then on very general grounds, you can show that the von Neumann entropy of uh, the von Neumann entropy of say subsystem A will coincide with its thermodynamic entropy as long as subsystem A is the small system. Okay, so the small system, so we have two subsystems A and B, A which are in contact with each other. B is the large system and A is the small system. The von Neumann entropy of the small system is effectively its thermodynamic entropy. And however, as the size of A becomes bigger and bigger, there's a crossover point where B becomes smaller than A. And at that point, the von Neumann entropy of A is this, which is the same as the von Neumann entropy of B because the von Neumann entropies are of A and its complement have to be the same. But the von Neumann entropy of B, since B is now the smaller system is given by the thermodynamic entropy of B. And that's from general considerations. And that's exactly uh, the argument which uh, Page used. And so you get this picture for the von Neumann entropy of the radiation. For early times, when the radiation is the smaller of the two systems, the entropy increases linearly with time. Then there is a crossover point where the radiation becomes the bigger system and the black hole is the smaller system. And then the von Neumann entropy of the radiation is given actually by the von Neumann entropy of the black hole, which is actually the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy of the black hole. And so the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy decreases and that's, that's how you get this page curve, which is, not in, which is not symmetric. And so this crossover point T page occurs at this, uh, at this, you know, at whatever the solution is to this, to this equation which is obtained by equating the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy at page time to the radiation entropy at page time. You can do the same analysis for near extremal black holes. And in that case, the temperature you know, decreases exponentially with time. And the exponent K here is the effective Newton's constant or the effective coupling of the matter fields uh, in the semi-classical limit to the gravity degrees of freedom. And it, JT gravity, this is often denoted by this little k. It is given by the 4D Newton's constant times number of degrees of freedom divided by three phi r, where phi r is effectively the area uh, of this, uh, of the horizon of the 4D black hole, roughly speaking, very roughly. So that's the, uh, so that's, uh, so that's the um, temperature profile as a function of time for the Reisner, for the near extremal Reissner Nordstrom black hole. And then the Bekenstein Hawking entropy uh, shows this behavior. There's an extremal portion plus an exponentially decaying part. Okay, and so the page curve for the von Neumann entropy looks like it's linearly increasing. And then at page time, there's a crossover and then it starts exponentially decreasing. There is no fine, I mean, evaporation actually occurs 
at asymptotically late times. In all cases, these are just two examples, but in all cases, the page time is a semi-classical time scale. It's a macroscopic time scale in the sense that it's order one over G Newton or order one over K in, in, this, uh, in terms of this parameter in JT gravity. So this is a semi-classical time scale. It's a non-perturbative time scale. And so it requires some kind of non-perturbative physics, which of course is exactly what happens when you have this uh, crossover between these two saddles, the no, no island saddle, which is the Hawking saddle and the uh, island saddle or the replica wormhole saddle point. That's a semi-classical cr crossover between two semi-classical saddle points. And so that's consistent with the um, with this picture that the page time that the time at which the crossover occurs is actually a time scale which which is macroscopic, but also the time scale when both the black hole and the radiation are in some sense macroscopic. Macroscopic. Okay, here's just I've just quoted the adiabatic limit just for reference that the adiabatic limit is a useful limit not just to understand this this line of argument, but it's also a very useful limit to look at uh, JT gravity, which is our concrete model in which we try to understand these phenomena from first principles. So now I come to this effective 2D description, which uh, is again, well-known JT gravity, except that now we want to think about this JT gravity coupled to radiation degrees of freedom or uh, conformal field theory, or in layman's terms, massless quantum field theory. So, the effective two-dimensional description uh, for the S wave of near extremal black holes uh, is basically given by a JT gravity black hole or the ADS2 black hole. And uh, the ADS2 black hole is covered by Kruskal coordinates, W plus, W minus, and that's what the metric looks like. Uh, there is no hint of any temperature in this, in this metric. All the information about the non-extremality or the temperature enters in the dilaton, which of course secretly is the area degree of freedom when we do the harmonic reduction. Say take a four dimensional black hole and uh, you do the S wave reduction. Then this dilaton is basically the area breathing mode uh, in the effective two dimensional language. So which is why I've written in this, is in this form phi over four G Newton, which is like the entropy. Uh, and so that's equal to phi naught over 4gn plus this temperature dependent piece. So the dilaton in JT gravity knows about the temperature. So for vanishing temperature, you get the extremal, uh, you get the extremal solution. And uh, when the temperature is turned on, the dilaton has a non-trivial profile. So this is all where the information about the temperature is residing. And the whole horizon in these coordinates is at W minus equals zero and W plus equals zero. So this is what describes the two-sided black hole uh, in, in JT gravity. And to understand the Hawking radiation problem, the simplification that is considered and that was considered in the papers by Almeri et al. and Pennington et al. where these um, replica wormhole saddle points were clarified the asymptotically flat radiation region is added on without dynamical gravity. So this, of course, this point requires lots of clarification because it's a subtle point. So here's the picture that the toy model picture of our evaporating black hole. Here we have the two-sided ADS2 black hole. And what's happening is we are glued on to either side, a Minkowski radiation bath where there is no gravity. So gravity is artificially turned off in these regions. And the rationale for doing that is because uh, the expectation that since the Hawking radiation is collected asymptotically at Cry plus, where, semi where in the semi-classical limit, we expect gravity fluctuations to be very weakly coupled. We do not expect that significant we do not expect that gravity, dynamical gravity plays a, plays a significant role in the Bath regions. And so to a first approximation, we ignore the dynamics of the gravity in the Minkowski Bath regions. And so we think about the ADS2 black hole, the two-sided black hole with a non-gravitating Bath and with transparent boundary conditions, 
at the boundaries of ADS. Transparent so that any radiation emitted by these black holes is uh, travels out to the Minkowski radiation regions or the Minkowski Bath regions and gathered by a detector at Sky Plus. Now, there are several issues which have been pointed out by various groups of authors, and I don't want to obviously get into details unless there are specific questions. But there are issues with this, as have been point pointed out by Karch, Raju, and various authors, co-authors, and several papers. Um, the first issue is that the graviton is, uh, the first issue is that the graviton is massive. Uh, in a, a, with these transparent boundary conditions because the stress tensor is not conserved, okay? So the graviton is massive. And so uh, the question is whether in whether this particular model with non-gravitating baths is actually relevant for realistic evaporating black holes with asymptotically flat uh, Minkowski space black holes with the gravitating radiation radi region. So this question has been posed and there have been various objections to it, but one has to, uh, but there are also counter objections to this because the general expectation is that the page curve or the islands picture that you get out of this JT gravity plus Minkowski bath picture, the page curve and the island story that you get off should be relevant and the picture should apply for realistic black holes, but perhaps for not so fine grained entropies. So somehow entropies which are not too fine-grained in the sense that uh, entropies which are fine-grained enough to detect the correlation between the Hawking radiation emitted and the degrees of freedom which are collected on the island, they're fine-grained enough to do that, but not so fine-grained that they, they take into account all the, uh, all the degrees of freedom which are present in a holographic description of gravity at sky plus. So somehow, if you take an adequately coarse grained description uh, of the degrees of freedom and a core, define a coarse grained entropy, then you will still get a page curve. There is still an information puzzle which can be posed in the language of the page curve. And the islands and the, the island paradigm that you get out of looking at this JT gravity plus non-gravitating bath picture should still continue to be relevant when the baths are made dynamically. So this is, for example, discussed in papers by Chetan Krishnan and Ghosh and uh, also Krishnan and another paper and with another co-author co who I forget. Uh, but so keeping these issues in mind, we, uh, you know, we can think about these issues and we can, we can either prevent it from making progress or we can go along with this and go along with this expectation that the page curves are and the, and the island picture is actually relevant for physical questions and move forward and see what we can learn. Any questions about this? Any question or comments? I think not. Mm. Okay. So in that case, we'll move on to basically understanding uh, first, a kind of different description of this system. So because we are considering this kind of simplified model, that of JT gravity or ADS2 black holes coupled to Minkowski baths, uh, we can give this description, we can give this system an alternative description which we can refer to as the microscopic description. And we know because ADS2 black holes are related by holography to quantum mechanics, zero plus one dimensional, uh, a zero plus one dimensional quantum mechanics, this picture of ADS2 coupled to a CFT bath that propagates in this entire background, including this, including the Minkowski uh, bath regions, uh, we can view it using holography as quantum mechanics coupled to conformal field theory, but conformal field theory on the half line. And the reason we think of this as conformal field theory on the half line is because we have basically half Minkowski spaces glued on. So we can view this uh, ADS2 black hole setup as boundary conformal field theory or conformal field theory with some boundary degrees of freedom uh, in some thermal-like state. 
in the deep infrared, this kind of a system, a CFT coupled to quantum mechanical boundary of de boundary degrees of freedom, uh, can essentially be given in a description in terms of boundary conformal field theory. So boundary conformal field theory is essentially just saying that you have a conformal field theory with some boundary and, the, and you want to put consistent boundary conditions that are consistent with conformal invariance. And uh, once you do that, you get a description which is compatible with the deep infrared of a CFT with some boundary quantum mechanical degrees of freedom whose ground state may have some entropy. And that ground state entropy then makes an appearance in any von Neumann entropies that you might calculate in this BCFT description. So we'll view this description of the system as a CFT coupled to quantum mechanics or its infrared limit, which is this BCFT, as the microscopic description of this ADS2 black hole plus CFT bath system. That's because the ADS2 black holes plus CFT radiation bath is kind of a semi-classical gravity description from which we get this island paradigm by looking at these saddle points. But by via holography, we have a more microscopic description of this system as a quantum mechanical system. In particular, in the infrared, we have a particularly simple description, which is just CFT with a boundary. And so we want to basically see what aspects of the physics that we can understand using this BCFT description can actually be captured by holography. Uh, by this ADS2 black hole plus the CFT radiation bath. So how can we understand the, uh, the appearance of the page curve and the BCFT description? And in particular, if you want to ask more refined questions, which can be answered in BCFT, how do they manifest themselves in the gravity description or the semi-classical gravity description? So we can study the system in complicated states, uh, but the simplest thing to do is to first look at the black holes in the hartle hawking state. So the hartle hawking state is basically the two-sided black hole, which we've just seen, but sliced at time t equals zero. So you just cut it, cut this diagram, cut this figure in half through the t equals zero slice and consider the forward evolution or the upward evolution of uh, these two sides. So that, that describes for us the black hole, the, uh, the hartle hawking state. In boundary conformal field theory, the same state is simply described by the so-called thermophilic double state of the boundary conformal field theory. So before we get into the details, let's just look at what we are trying to summarize, what we are trying to understand. We have the ADS2 black hole plus the bath in the hartle hawking state. This is in bound to one correspondence. Then there is a problem with the microphone. There is a problem with the microphone. I can't able to hear. I see. Some disturbance is coming. Can you speak again? Your, your microphone is uh, switched off. Please unmute yourself. Please unmute.
Can you hear me now? Yeah, but I, I, there is a I think the connection with the iPad is completely okay. It's about, it's about your speaker. I might have to uh, probably speaker. I might have to leave and join again because uh, things are not responding. Response to the screen is very very slow, so I don't know exactly what's happened. Abhishek, can you able to hear this voice? No, sir. It's cracking a lot. Yeah, it's cracking a lot. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. You can do that. Okay. Your screen is visible.
sorry guys please wait a bit uh, there is an issue with uh, the microphone we need to restart the computer i think All right. Now you can hear now, me. Now I can able to hear. There is an issue with the speaker. I think. Is it because? So, right. so now can you hear me yes it's clear yeah it's completely clear all right okay sorry about that no no it's perfect all right so where was i before i don't know exactly what happened but whatever happened it's fixed Okay, so we were this picture where we were discussing, we were talking about the um, the connection between this ADS two black hole in the Hartle Hawking state and boundary conformal field theory in the thermal field double state. And so here, so the what we what we intend to do is compute, for example, things like von Neumann entropies of radiation in this. Uh, in the CFT picture, in the microscopic picture, and and then understand how they are computed in the, in the corresponding gravity picture, and how are islands in particular, which are realized in the gravity picture, how they show up in the boundary conformal field theory picture. So that is the basic uh, kind of question that we uh, set out to answer. So. Uh, the starting point is basically thinking about the system in the thermophile double state. So the thermophile double state is basically uh, the so-called purification of the thermal state. So in the CFT language, you're basically taking two CFTs, CFT left and CFT right. And uh, the, two, the two are prepared in this entangled state. So left cross right with these weights and the system uh, undergoes unitary time of time evolution. So this is in this direct product uh, Hilbert space. This is a pure state. And the time evolution is performed by the Hamiltonian H left plus H right. And you can see clearly here that this is a non-trivial time dependent state. So it's a state which is not in equilibrium. It's not describing equilibrium physics. Nevertheless, one must keep in mind that if you take any set of local operators in either the left or the right CFT and you compute their expectation value in the thermophile double state, you recover the thermal expectation value. So this means that observables or local observables in either CFT left or CFT right, local observables are in thermal equilibrium are observe local operators and their correlation functions are the same as you would expect in a system in thermodynamic equilibrium. But the state is not in global equilibrium, which means in particular, it's not in entanglement or information equilibrium. And in particular, if you compute any correlators that straddle uh, that of, of between operators that straddle the left and the right, then you will in general find that those correlators depend on time. So in particular, this is true for entanglement entropy. Uh, so for example, let's take the case of two semi-infinite intervals. 
So here we have uh, CFT left and we have CFT right, both drawn on the same picture. The spatial coordinate on both the CFTs, you know, increases to the increases that way away from the boundary. The boundary is a quantum mechanical system at x equals zero, and uh, we pick some interval, which uh, which starts off at some point x equals a, and goes all the way to x equals infinity on one side, x equals a, and x equals infinity on the other side. So we have two CFTs left and right, and we consider the union of these two intervals. A left union A right. So A left is A infinity on the left CFT. A right is A infinity on the right CFT. Now we want to do a CFT calculation and compute the von Neumann entropy of, of the union of these two, the disjoint union of these two. Okay, so the picture again is that this is. Um, The picture is that this system is again, its dual description holographically is in terms of this two-sided black hole, okay? Uh, sliced off at t equals zero and evolved forward in time or upward in time. So that's the holographic description of this system. So we want to compute the von Neumann entropy of this. Now, in the holographic description, what this corresponds to in the thermofield double state is computing the von Neumann entropy in all the Hawking radiation, which is received in the union of these two semi-infinite semi intervals. If we make this little a here approach the origin, that means we, can, we can compute the von Neumann entropy of all the Hawking radiation that's that's received. But generically, we can choose little a to be different from zero and just think about uh, these two semi infinite intervals. Now, to do this calculation in CFT, what you do is you insert twist operators. The twist operators in CFTs are operators with specific conformal dimensions. They implement the replica trick. So, by inserting the twist operators, what you're doing is replicating the boundary conformal field theory n times for twist operators with labeled by this integer n. And so when you compute a twist operator, a twist anti-twist correlator, what you're computing is the Rennie entropy, or the nth Rennie entropy of the given interval. So for this case, we insert a twist operator tau n uh, in say the right CFT at x equals a, and an anti-twist operator in the left CFT, again at x equals a. And the correlator between this operators inserted on the left and the right, that's a twist anti-twist correlator that straddles the left and the right CFTs. And so if you compute this Rennie entropy and then divide by one minus n and take the limit n goes to one, you obtain the von Neumann entropy. Now, here's the interesting thing. In boundary conformal field theory, you can compute these correlation, correlation functions of any chiral primary fields by using something called the double copy trick or the image trick. So for example, and assuming for this in this particular picture that we are in the Euclidean picture, because that's where it's easiest to think about this. Imagine that you have some CFT operator which with chiral and antichiral weights or holomorphic and anti-holomorphic weights, H and H. And the, the operator is a function of Z and Z bar as a generic CFT primary would be. Suppose you want to compute the one point function of this operator in boundary conformal field theory. That means CFT with a boundary. And in this picture, we have the CFT formulated in the upper half plane with a boundary at uh, along the x-axis or the real axis, then boundary CF BCFT rules tell us that this correlator is computed by considering the chiral conformal field theory on the full plane and inserting uh, a second uh, chiral, chiral uh, operator, OZ, at the image point of the first point. So in particular, OH, H, Z, Z bar in BCFT is given by 
the chiral correlator in chiral safety of OH of Z times OH of Z star. Where now on the right hand side, the CFT is, is defined on the whole plane. This is kind of the equivalent of the image trick in electrostatics. So in BCFT, inserting an operator here and computing its one point function is like computing the two point function in a chiral CFT, which is defined in the whole plane. And you can use the same logic for two point functions and n point functions. So if you're interested in the two point function, of a twist and an anti-twist operator in BCFT, where both the left and the right CFTs are BCFTs because they have boundaries. This reduces to a four point function in a chiral CFT in the double copy. And a four point function can be computed, but it's not universal for a given, for it's not a, there's no universal result for four point functions and CFTs. So for example, you can pick your favorite CFT. Example, the simplest example one can think of is that of free fermions. And you compute this four point correlator. Calculating this four point correlator and taking this limit n goes to one gives you the von Neumann entropy of the disjoint union of these two intervals, A left and A right. So you can do this in free fermion CFT in the thermofield double state. And this is the exact result you get. So there are two pieces in this exact result. The first bit is actually nothing, but if you look at this, it is log sine hyperbolic pi over beta times X left minus X right coordinates. And similarly, sine hyperbolic pi over beta X left minus minus X right minus. So these are the light cone coordinates of the two points where the twist operators were inserted. And so the first bit actually gives us nothing but the entanglement, the naive entanglement entropy of this interval. So if you consider the complement of these semi-infinite intervals, which is these two finite intervals, zero comma A and zero comma A on the left and the right. And you imagine that you were just computing the von Neumann entropy of those two intervals in a CFT without boundary, the result you would get would be the first, first term here. The fact that the CFT has a boundary makes its appearance in the second term. The second term is log of eta. And eta is what we call the cross ratio. In this case, the thermal cross ratio. And because basically because there are four points, it's a four point correlation function. And so there is a conformal cross ratio, a dimensionless cross ratio of these, uh, the coordinates of these four points. In the thermal state or the thermophile double state, the algebraic cross ratio, right, is just replaced by sine by a ratio of sine hyperbolics. Okay, that's the only difference that happens when you go from the zero temperature case to the finite temperature case. And if you notice, it is the, if you notice the first two terms, uh, they link left and right, but you see that the first term, it, it depends on left plus and right plus coordinates. The second term here inside the log depends on left minus and right minus coordinates. The cross ratio on the other hand, links plus and minus plus and minus. And there's a reason for this. Uh, you can, okay, we'll, this, we'll, come to the, we'll come to the reason behind this structure in a bit, but you can take this exact expression and you can just plot it as a function of time. And you discover that the von Neumann entropy of these two semi-infinite intervals in BCFT language shows linear growth at early times and saturates at late times. This is a picture that is, you know, in general, it's true for any temperature. The growth is not exactly linear. It starts off exponential and then becomes quickly becomes linear and then turns around. This kink between these two linear and uh, saturated, you know, saturation behavior, this kink becomes arbitrarily sharp as the temperature is becomes larger and larger. And also you can see that in this in the transition between these two reg regimes, the linear and the saturation regime, the cross ratio eta goes from eta equals one to eta equals zero. 
So in this linear regime, when eta is one, there is no contribution from the log eta term. And the entropy behaves exactly like the entropy that you would expect from field theory without a boundary. The effect of the boundary becomes apparent after this shoulder or the kink when the cross ratio suddenly moves from eta equals one to eta equals zero, almost like a step function jump. And the step function becomes sharper and sharper as the temperature becomes larger or beta goes to zero. And in the limit that beta approaches zero, the exact, you can, you can describe this, this entire curve by basically an exact expression, which is the minimum of a linear part, which is pi C T over three beta and uh, a constant part, which we write as twice log G B plus pi C over three beta times A. So we can understand each of these terms here in this expression quite in a very simple way. The first term here is nothing but the thermal entropy of a one dimensional gas of bosons. And it increases linearly with time as you collect more and more of this gas, of this radiation gas. But this expression, the minimum of these two tells us that this, this linear growth will saturate and it saturates precisely at a value given by twice the boundary entropy. Log GB is the, uh, log GB is the entropy of the boundary degree associated to the boundary degrees of freedom in BCFT. Twice the log, twice log GB because we have a thermofield double state. And we have this constant pi C over three beta times A, which just gives us the thermal entropy, the max, the thermal entropy associated to this finite region, zero A. So what this expression is telling us is that the maximum the maximum uh, uh, von Neumann entropy that you can have for these two intervals, the union of these two intervals, uh, is basically the sum of the boundary entropies and the thermal entropy of this complementary interval. This is exactly what one gets when one uses the island prescription. And we'll talk about this in a minute. So this this crossover between this uh, linear regime and the saturation regime, this kink occurs at a time that I will call page time. And at this page time, what happens is that there is an exchange between two different operator product channels in these correlation functions. The reason there is an exchange in the operator product channels is because at early times, the operator product channel is governed by the eta equals one value for the cross ratio. And late times it's governed by the eta equals zero channel associated to this cross ratio. And what these two values of these cross ratios correspond to in terms of OPE channels is basically you take the two points in the left CFT, okay? The left CFT, the left copy of the BCFT in the thermophile double state and the right copy of the BC, BCFT in the thermophile double state. So we have the coordinates of these two points, light cone coordinates. So we have X right plus, which is the location of that point X equals A, which was where we inserted the twist, twist operators. And in, in the left BCFT, that's at X, X left plus. Now in this image method of computing correlators, uh, we are taking the BCFT and its image, the image points of these points on the right are at X right minus and X left minus on the left. So eta equals one regime is when the four point correlator of the twist operators is dominated by the connected contribution to the OPEs. So in particular, the left and the right are connected. It's this channel which dominates the four point correlator and in the other regime, which is the eta equals zero regime, which is the so-called disconnected regime. In this regime, the left and the right are disconnected. And what dominates, what contribute, what dominates the correlation function is a contraction between X left 
between the point x left fist operator insertion at x left plus with its image point on x left minus. This basically is the one point function of the twist operator in any given CFT. So early time, the von Neumann entropy is governed precisely by the radiation entropy, which doesn't know about the boundary. At late times, the von Neumann entropy, which is given by the twist anti-twist correlator in BCFT, that undergoes a factorization. And there is a factorization through this disconnected channel, which gives us the product of the one point functions in each BCFT. And the product of the one point functions in BCFT, when you take its log to compute the von Neumann entropy, precisely get twice log GB. So essentially we can understand this transition between these two dynamical regimes as a transition between OPE channels in BCFT, going from connected to disconnected. So what we are seeing here is that boundary conformal field theory automatically implements the unitarity that we seek in the page curve description for the two-sided black hole. The von Neumann entropy at early times, well, von Neumann entropy of these two semi-infinite intervals basically cannot exceed twice the boundary entropy plus the thermal entropy in the finite interval zero comma. So uh, famously, this calculation was done in the JT gravity examples and those papers that we, in the, in the well-known papers. And the picture is that in JT gravity, you're interested in computing the von Neumann entropy of radiation crossing these two semi-infinite intervals in the Minkowski bath, right? And uh, what you should do is basically consider uh, the generalized entropy, which is obtained by considering island regions, which are depicted in the second picture. And you consider the CFT entropy of uh, R union I, which means you consider R and you consider this island region U, uh, sorry, island region I, consider the union, compute the CFT entropy. Then at the boundaries of these islands, which are the so-called quantum extremal surfaces, you evaluate phi over four GN, the contribution from the quantum extremal surfaces, add all these together and extremize with respect to the location of the quantum extremal surfaces. And the extremal value should give you the uh, correct generalized entropy or the fine grained entropy. So this calculation gives us first the no island contribution, which is when there are no islands, the no island contribution to the entropy of the Hawking radiation, S von Neumann, is just given by von Neumann of the complement, which is this, which is this region D. Uh, and when you compute it using the CFT techniques in curved space time, the result is just C over six log cosh hyperbolic of two pi times the temperature times time. At late times, this is exactly linear growth. In fact, this entire expression matches the BCFT expression. The same thing is now you can do this for the island contributions for which you have to compute the generalized entropy. You go through this calculation and you discover that the island contribution to the entropy of the von Neumann and radiation using the generalized entropy formula is given by twice the Bekenstein Hawking entropy plus certain subleading contributions. And here the von Neumann entropy is just minimum of pi CT over three uh, and twice the black hole entropy. So the generalized entropy in the JT gravity picture exactly reproduces the BCFT expectation, exactly reproduces. As long as you identify twice the boundary entropy, twice log GB with the Bekenstein Hawking entropy of the black hole. So in, in, a, very, uh, in a very precise sense, there is a correspondence between BCFT results and what we get from JT gravity using this generalized entropy formula. And very specifically, the island contributions in JT gravity, these island contributions get associated to disconnected OP channels in the boundary conformal field theory picture. Are there any questions at this stage? Any questions or comments? Please ask if you have anything. 
Okay, you continue. I think no question. All right. So, um, so now we look at a more non-trivial example. So this is the kind of game you can play when you want to understand more and more refined questions about the Hawking radiation. And in fact, it becomes quite interesting to see how this whole uh, mechanics works. Uh, in this particular example of the semi-infinite intervals, let me point out that uh, this is the analog of the information loss paradox for the two-sided black hole in the Hartle Hawking state. Uh, essentially, the page curve doesn't turn around and come back to zero because uh, the two black holes are in thermal equilibrium. They don't evaporate away. They are so in prepared in this thermophile double state. So at late times, the maximum, sorry, the, uh, the maximum entropy that the radiation can have is basically the entropy that the black holes, the black holes themselves have. And there are two black holes. So the maximum entropy is twice the Bekenstein Hawking entropy of the black hole. So the key point to note is that in this example, the early time behavior is governed by the connected channels, which is the no, no island channel in the gravity language and late time behavior is associated with disconnected channels. This is typically the case for any generic state that you might prepare the system in. The late time equilibration of Hawking radiation entropy or the von Neumann entropy on Hawking radiation is achieved by the island saddles. And in CFT language, that's, a, that's achieved by the disconnected contribution to OPE channels. However, this is not always the case. And here is a very simple example where this does not occur. In fact, something more complicated occurs and more interesting occurs. So this is the case where we have basically two finite intervals. So we consider the left and the, and the right BCFTs, and we consider two finite intervals labeled by the points X equals A and X equals B. Um, and Uh, so now the point is both on a left and on a right, we have two distinguished points to each, each of these points. Sorry, there are two points on either side. And these two points basically tell us, mark out the interval of interest. And so we are interested in the von Neumann entropy of now the union of these two finite intervals, a left and a right. There are four distinguished points or four endpoints, and therefore there are four twist anti-twist operators, two on the left BCFT and two on the right BCFT. And we insert these operators and we compute their expectation value in the BCFT. But this is a four point function in BCFT. So using the double copy rule, this becomes an eight point function in a chiral CFT in the thermophile double state. Now, this is admittedly very complicated but again, if you focus attention on the free fermion theory, then you can get an exact answer. The exact answer I will not write down. It's too long to write down. It's not very illuminating, but you can plot the result for the von Neumann entropy of the union of these two intervals. And the result is quite interesting. And the result is interesting in the following sense uh, provided. So this is a picture where we have two uh, large, intervals and large here is this criterion b greater than 3a which just somehow comes out but its physical significance is that you consider two intervals uh these two, these two intervals of equal sizes identical intervals on the left and the right such that the size of this interval is uh is larger than the distance of this endpoint from the boundary so the, in this, this is what we mean by a large interval. Large interval is one whose, whose length is comparable to the distance of its nearest point to the boundary. So for large intervals, you start, you see this highly non-monotonic uh, behavior for the von Neumann entropy. At early times, so we, when which we have identified or broken up into five distinct temporal regimes. At early times, we have linear growth, followed by a slightly slower linear growth, then surprisingly a dip 
and then an increase, and then finally saturation. So there are these four, uh, five distinct regimes, temporal regimes. Now, each of these regimes, if you look at the curves, I've actually labeled them with, um, so the regimes are labeled with Roman numerals. And, and these uh, curves themselves, the different portions of the curves are labeled uh, by just numbers. And uh, I should remark that this is, this is the shape of the curve that emerges in the high temperature limit. At finite temperature, the curve will look really smooth and all these points look like crossover points. But very quickly as temperature becomes reasonably small, say five or six in some dimensionless units, you start seeing this piecewise linear behavior uh, showing up for the exact function. In fact, this, this behavior is not just unique to the free fermion theory, it will apply to any CFT. There's actually a universal result for any CFT in the high temperature regime. This includes, for example, large C CFTs that have a holographic interpretations. If you take the high temperature limit, and you compute the von Neumann entropies, you will discover that this is exactly the shape that the curve follows. Von Neumann entropy, entropy for the union of two finite intervals in the thermofield double state. So now what are these distinct, uh, you know, distinct numbers here, two, three, four, and one. These correspond to distinct CFT OPE channels. Okay, so here are the distinct OP channels that are relevant for this particular configuration of two intervals. So remember that there are two points on either side. So therefore there are two twist operator insertion points. So it's really a, a eight point function in the double copy picture. So this is a depiction, schematic depiction of these channels. So here we have the two endpoints on the right side plus the BCFT images, double copy images, the two endpoints on the left side and their double copy images. And this is a channel where basically uh, we have a contraction between, uh, between you know, the, 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 the points on any given side. And so there is no contraction basically that's linking the left and left and the right, nor are there any contractions that are linking the any BCFT points with their images. Okay, uh, there's a second. So th this is channel one. Channel two, uh, what it does is it links the left and the right points, but there is no link between uh, BCFT points and a double copy image. So one and two are called connected BC connected channels in, in this correlator. And in fact, these one and two channels, if you look at their behavior, they're actually describing the late time behavior and the very early time behavior. The late time behavior is given by this. And if you compute, if you compute the correlator in this channel, the result is just given by the thermal entropy of two finite disjoint intervals. So here, the von Neumann entropy of the radiation that is gathered in two finite disjoint intervals at late times, it reaches a saturation value simply given by the thermal, ent the, the thermal entropy of radiation in that interval. And that makes sense because the intervals are finite. So as you keep gathering more and more radiation, it has to saturate at some point because you have finite intervals and the most interval you can, most entropy you can have in a finite interval of a given size at a fixed temperature is just the classical thermal entropy of radiation in that interval. So it's an extensive result proportional to the size of the interval. And so that's basically the late time behavior. The early time behavior comes from this connected channel between the left and the right. And that can also be intuitively understood in terms of um, entanglement between different between modes uh, on the left and the right CFTs, which uh, a picture that I'll briefly summarize as we get to the end. The end is very close. So one and two are disconnected channels, uh, sorry, are connected channels, and they contribute to the early time and the late time behavior. But something's happening in the intermediate time scales. 
And this is where these two additional channels come in, three and four. Three and four, the way I've drawn them, as you can see, it involves not only linkages between left and right, but also in linkages between the CFT insertion points and their images. On the, this on the left side and this on the right side. This is a disconnected channel. What I mean by that is that in the correlator, there is a partial factor, the, the eight point correlator involving, uh, you know, in the, uh, these twist operators and their anti-twist cousins, there is a partial factorization of the correlator. And so this is a partially disconnected channel three. And here's channel four, which is another disconnected channel. But here, this is not only is there a connection between left and right, but there's actually a connection simultaneously between BCFT points on the left and the image points on the right. And if you look at the temporal behavior of the correlators coming from these distinct channels, you see that channel three is responsible for this slower growth rate. And channel four is responsible for the dip and the rise following the dip. It's highly non-trivial. So somehow the early time behavior and the late time behavior are controlled by connected correlators, but the intermediate time behavior is controlled by disconnected OPE channels in the BCFT language. So here, disconnected channels dominate at intermediate times. And our intuition from looking at the earlier semi-infinite problem is that island should correspond to disconnected channels. So it must be that this intermediate time regime, which is dominated by three and four, in this graph, three and four, channels three and four, should correspond to islands uh, in the gravity picture. And so there are two questions that we want to understand. Number one, how do, how do we get these islands that describe this non-monotonic behavior of the von Neumann entropy of two finite intervals? And how do we understand this non-monotonic behavior? In fact, the non-monotonic behavior is actually quite surprising because if you take these two intervals to be small, so these A and B are taken to be such that the interval B minus A, the size of the interval B minus A is small compared to the distance of the interval from the boundaries. If you do that, then you some, see something that's quite counterintuitive at first sight. The von Neumann entropy of radiation grows Excuse me. Von Neumann entropy of radiation grows, but then it saturates. And, and then surprisingly, after it looks like it has equilibrated, suddenly there is a dip that, that appears, and then the system again re-equilibrates. Looks very mysterious why there should be a dip at all. Because it looks like the entropy has grown, the system has equilibrated, reached its saturation reached information saturation equilibrium and then suddenly there is a dip and so it looks mysterious at first sight and one would want to understand how one sees this kind of non-monotonic behavior and the dip from the gravity picture so i'll just very briefly and very quickly tell you what happens in the gravity side in the gravity side you basically look at you know this uh, ads2 black hole in the thermofield double state so we have these two finite intervals, one left, which I call one left, two left. These are the endpoints on A left, on the left Minkowski bar, one right, two right. That's the endpoints of the interval A right and the right Minkowski bar. We now consider the free fermion CFT. It doesn't have to be, it can be any CFT, but for concreteness and simplicity, we take the free fermion CFT on this background. Uh, we can compute the von Neumann entropy of the no island contribution for free fermions in this background, right? So remember, this is not a BCFT anymore. This is the holographic dual picture with CFT propagating in this gravitating background. In the no island picture, we just compute the CFT entropy in this curve, in this, in this, in this geometry. And the result is just given by the, by the result for the entanglement entropy of two disjoint intervals, A left union, A right, in CFT without boundary. 
And that is immediately gets identified with the result that we got from the connected channels of the BCFT computation. So, so the no island calculation in the gravity side, it's trivial actually. So it, one doesn't need to in fact do the calculation, but one can uh, see that trivially that the calculation that, one, that, that does on the gravity side is the same as the connected channel for the BCFT. And so if one looks at the two uh, connected channels, which I've already discussed, these two connected ch channels basically give you the linear growth at early time, proportional to time, and late time saturation into thermal entropy, proportional to the size of the intervals B minus A. That comes from the connected channels in the BCFT language, in ADS2 gravity language that coming from the no island contribution. The question is now, what is the nature of the island saddles that give rise to the other channels in BCFT? So now you do an analysis and there is some intuition that you can draw already from the BCFT picture. The fact that there are in the BCFT disconnected channels involved the factorization of two or a pair of twist and anti-twists basically tells us that we need two quantum extremal surfaces in the gravity picture. So in particular, intuitively, one can, one can think of the BCFT image points as being in one-to-one -one correspondence with the quantum extremal surfaces. It's a little bit more subtle than that, but uh, roughly speaking, that's the language. So we consider basically uh, look for saddle points of the generalized entropy functional with two quantum extremal surfaces. In this case, I've shown quantum extremal surfaces sitting outside the horizon. In between them is the island region. And so you consider the generalized entropy functional, which is the dilaton evaluated at these two quantum extremal surface points uh, added together, plus the uh, CFT entropy of A left, union A right, union the island. And how do I know what these quantum extremal surfaces points are? Well, I have to extremize this guy with respect to the coordinates of one Q and two Q, which are the coordinates of the quantum extremal surface points. And after doing the extremization, I look for the values and that determines the locations of the quantum extremal surface. This is very, very complicated to do in practice. It cannot be done exactly simply because the equations are you know, not analytically tractable. Uh, but a regime in the high temperature regime, when beta is small, and when the scrambling time is small, you can actually get an exact matching of everything that we do with the BCFT results. And I'll just summarize this very, very briefly without getting into the details we basically get two scenarios. One scenario is when the quantum extremal surfaces sit outside the horizon. You do the extremization procedure and you discover that the coordinates of these two points, one Q and two Q shown in this position, sorry, shown, shown in this picture, lie outside the horizon exactly as depicted here. And then for that particular saddle or for that particular regime, when you calculate the generalized entropy, you find that it grows linearly with time, okay? But with a, with a coefficient, which is half of that, of what you see in the early time linear growth. So in this picture, there's an early time linear growth and there is a slightly later time linear growth. The slope of this turns out to be precisely half of that. And that one can see emerging exactly from this particular quantum extremal surface solution where both quantum extremal surfaces lie outside the horizon. In fact, not only that, one can see an exact matching between these expressions and the BCFT expressions provided one identifies the black, the Bekenstein Hawking entropy with log GB, the boundary entropy. The regimes, Three and four, which are describing the dip, this regime and this regime, which are controlled by the disconnected BCFT channel four. Well, if you follow the uh, calculation from the gravity side, you discover that 
these correspond to when the quantum extremal surfaces lie inside the horizon. And you can solve for the coordinates of these points and you discover that interestingly, the quantum extremal surface for this case, in this regime, the coordinate, the location of this quantum extremal surface is determined by the light cone coordinates of the points of the interval on the left. And similarly, the location of the quantum extremal surface that appears here, this left one, is determined by the locations of these interval points on the right, which is intuitively kind of reminiscent of what's happening with the BCFT channels. These BCFT channels, they are linking left and right while also linking the image points with the BCFT points. So in a sense, there is a very detailed correlation between the picture that one sees in BCFT and one sees in, uh, in gravity. And so in, these, in this regime where the quantum extremal surfaces move inside the horizon, one sees an exact match between the results for the generalized entropy that one gets from gravity and what one gets from BCFT. And the exact match describes exactly the curve that I showed you with the dip and the rise following a minimum. So uh, basically the moral of the story is that in the high temperature limit and small scrambling time limit, the black hole essentially is described by boundary conformal field theory. It's described very well from by boundary conformal field theory. In a sense, it's a very trivial limit for the black hole because the scrambling time is now arbitrarily small. Uh, if you move in the gravity side, however, you can move away from these strict limits of BCFT and you can see that all these different regimes that we saw, which look like different piecewise regimes, they're actually smoothly connected to each other. And in fact, across <clears throat> uh, as a function of time, what you see is that the quantum extremal surfaces uh, start off initially outside the horizon, but smoothly move inside and then reach some saturation value uh, uh, at late times. So there's a very nice description, qualitative agreement, both between boundary conformal field theory and with gravity, which continues to hold uh, away from the strict BCFT limit. Now comes the final uh, bit of the talk, which is to kind of describe why this dip occurs. So there is this mysterious dip in the uh, von Neumann entropy of the two intervals. Why does that occur? And the reason it occurs is basically because of purification of modes which are being gathered in these two intervals, A left union, A right. And it occurs for a very specific reason, uh, which, is, which, has to do with the therm which, which has to do with the entanglement structure of the thermophile double state. So in the thermophile double state, the way I've drawn it in this picture, it's quite convenient. Uh, the way the thermophile double state is set up, uh, it's basically, what you're doing is taking the field theory, its forward time evolution, and then taking the field theory and its backward time evolution. You're taking the two things and treating them as copies of each other and entangling them. In the process, what happens is that you maximally entangle incoming modes. In other words, when I say incoming, I mean modes that are coming towards the boundary. You maximally entangle modes that are incoming in one of the copies of the QFT with modes that are outgoing in the other copy. So in this particular picture, the way I've drawn it, this is the right CFT along the x-axis moving to the right. This is the left CFT, x-axis towards the left. This here is the boundary. Basically, uh, these blue modes are like outgoing modes in the left CFT, but these are maximally entangled with incoming modes on the right CFT. But you see incoming modes on the right CFT can get reflected. And so precisely when the uh, outgoing modes in the left CFT and the reflected modes, the reflected partners or reflected purifiers in the right CFT, when they are together gathered in A left union, A right, 
the entanglement entropy experiences a dip. There is a temporary purification. And you can see that in this, this is actually an effectively a geometric optics picture because we all we need to do in order to understand the onset of the dip, how long the dip lasts, and when the uh, entanglement entropy again starts to rise and saturates, all we need to do is perform ray tracing. But the physics is very simple. The physics is simply telling us that uh, there are outgoing modes on the left entangled with uh, incoming modes that get reflected on the right and are gathered, and that causes the dip. And the same thing with left and right flipped. So this explains the dip in a very simple way. It's the physics of reflection of light rays. Uh, but of course, in the black hole, it's quite counterintuitive if you try to understand what's happening in this limit. The black hole must behave effectively like a reflector. But the way, the mechanics of how the information recovery in black hole proceeds looks a little bit more involved than it does in BCFT, where it's just reflection from a mirror. In the black holes, in the gravity picture, of course, there is no boundary. Well, there is no reflecting boundary. There is a transparent boundary. So these blue rays, which are outgoing on the left, and they are gathered by this in this left interval, they're, uh, they're purifiers, the blue ones on the right, uh, they are incoming modes, but these incoming modes fall into the black hole. Right? But how are they gathered? Well, they get gathered by the island. And the island prescription requires us to basically think of this island region as being part of the exterior. And so, uh, you know, if you include the island as part of the exterior, then the purification process is guaranteed at exactly the right time, provided the quantum extremal surface is located at the right coordinate. In some sense, you can reverse engineer the positions of these quantum extremal surfaces and the islands by from the BCFT picture. Uh, what is interesting here is that, you see, uh, while the islands basically guarantee that the behavior of the entanglement entropy, in other words, the behavior of the information, the quantum information is uh, guaranteed to come out right, the flux of the radiation requires these additional these additional yellow modes. It needs this flux coming in from the ADS interior region to be gathered. So somehow the way the mechanics of the uh, BCFT purification and radiation gathering is re reproduced in the black hole picture is slightly more involved. The mechanics is slight, has more moving parts. You need the island to guarantee uh, to guarantee that this purification occurs at the right time and the dip occurs at the right time. But you also need these ADS, these modes coming in from the ADS region and their purifiers, the ones that are shown in yellow, to be gathered by this interval and the island. So somehow there are additional, there's additional moving parts in the correspondence between uh, the BCFT picture and the island picture. Okay, so I'll summarize here and end here. So I think I've used up all my time, surprisingly. The BCFT limit is a particularly sim simple limit for the black hole. The reason this limit is particularly interesting is because uh, we, can, we, can, we have a starting point, an anchor point, to talk about this microscopic BCFT picture and relate it in a one-to-one -one way with the black hole picture. There is clearly a one-to-one -one correspondence between BCFT uh, uh, description and BCFT channels and this islands and the quantum extremal surfaces in this high temperature limit for the black hole. In this limit, the black hole becomes trivial because information recovery occurs by reflection because the scrambling time is negligible. So one is basically saying that the time scales for at which we are on which we are focusing attention on are much larger compared to the thermalization time scales. Uh, but of course, in the black hole side, we can actually systematically move, uh, improve upon this approximation uh, and actually move away uh, from the BCFT limit. So the black hole interior has a very simple interpretation, a simple relationship to the BCFT image. Uh, positions of the quantum extremal surfaces can be fixed in principle by geometric optics argument. We haven't 
actually completely understood this, but uh, uh, it looks like this can be done. Um, there is an interesting uh, other, you know, another set of observations is that disconnected channels in boundary conformal field theory, which link left and right in this case, yield quantum extremal surfaces inside the horizon, which with decreasing entropy, the one that caused the dip. Otherwise, the quantum extremal surfaces always remain outside, associated with increasing entropy. In fact, we have seen the same thing in genuinely non-equilibrium situations when you have a dynamically evaporating black hole, the quantum extremal surfaces always live inside the horizon. So it seems that somehow quantum extremal surfaces are associated inside the horizon are associated with decreasing entropy. It's not something that we completely understand why this is the case. Uh, there are various interesting things that can one, one can now start understanding in particular because there is this one-to-one -one correspondence between the BCFT picture and the black hole picture. One can understand how to extract information out from the island into the, into the radiation. And this can be done in the BCFT picture by doing something like modular flow, acting on the boundary degrees of freedom by some operator and then using the BC, BCFT modular Hamiltonian to induce modular flow and pull out that action uh, into the bulk of the CFT. So there's uh, several interesting physical questions. I um, think I have uh, yeah, exhausted my time and exhausted the audience as well. But thanks very much for your attention. I'll just stop there. Thank you Ray, for giving such an elaborative and nice talk. Now it's time for questions and comments. If anybody has any specific questions, comments, or clarification, please ask the. Uh, Sir, I have a question. Uh, before that, please unmute all of you and give a clap for Prem for giving such a nice talk. Uh, and yeah, please, please continue with your question. Uh, sir, I have a question. Uh, so, uh, so the transition at the page time is uh, instantaneous, or does it like uh, like the transition is a little bit flat? Or uh... yeah, there is always a crossover. Uh, so, if you look at the CFT calculation, you will always see that there is a crossover. Uh, and in fact, you know the exact the exact formula that I that I wrote down here, you can. You can plot it on Mathematica, and you will see that actually there is an ex early time exponential growth followed by something that looks linear, and there's a smooth crossover. At late times, this saturates. So that probably the curve that I've drawn here by hand doesn't actually show, but it, sat it reaches saturation uh, exponentially. Uh, but then as you increase the temperature, you will find that these two, uh, that this transition becomes uh, sharper and sharper, it becomes kink-like. Uh, in fact, uh, in fact, you can understand the the exchange between these two channels. You can understand it exactly as an exchange between two saddle points, even in CFT. Uh, provided, if you think about large C conformal field theories. In large C conformal field theories, when you look at four point functions, which is what we looked at to extract this curve, four point functions can be, uh, can be written in terms of conformal blocks. And these conformal blocks can be evaluated by a saddle points. And the saddle points, there are two different saddle points again that dominate for these uh, four point correlators. And they're precisely the two BCFT channels that I described. So there's actually a one-to-one -one correspondence between what we see in gravity in terms of exchange of saddles, replica wormhole versus Hawking saddle or no island versus no island saddle. Uh, and there's an exact analog of that in CFT. In the strict large C limit, you can, uh, you see a crossover between two saddles. And so the, uh, uh, so the kink is sharp. Uh, but interestingly, you can reach that same behavior by taking any CFT and taking the high temperature limit. So it's as if the, you know, in, in the case of the free fermion theory, the reason why you get this sharp exchange of channels is because of the high temperature semi-classical limit. 
as opposed to large C semi-classical limit for large C CFTs. But yeah, so there is some interesting physics in this, you know, hiding in this crossover, which is which goes beyond this pure, you know, classical semi-classical approximation. Uh, and want to be able to extract that probably in gravity, but that's that's a harder question in gravity. Yeah. Another question is like, uh, can we define the island near the singularity, or how do we choose the like boundary of the islands? Yeah, that's a, a good point. So uh, if you go back to this, so uh, which I did not, uh, good question actually. So the island itself, right? The, actually the invariant okay the the invariant information is in the location of the quantum extremal surfaces the island itself is just some cauchy slice uh, which which basically re, you know lies in the causal development of the as long as the cauchy slice is some space like slice that lies in the causal development associated to these quantum extremal surface points it doesn't matter you know what exactly this curve is doesn't really matter because um, all that math, you know, if you think about it practically, when you're gathering radiation, come back to this picture, all that matters is the light cone coordinates of these points, of, of the intervals associated to these, point, these points. It doesn't matter what the island, you know, this curve here, the black is just for some reference. It's not, it's not important what the shape of this guy is. What is important is the location of the quantum extremal surfaces. And that's what gets determined by the extremization procedure in, of, uh, of the generalized entropy. So the generalized entropy depends upon the location of these endpoints of the islands or the boundaries of the islands. And then that's what you're trying to extremize. Thank you, sir, for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, any other question? Comments. Obviously, do you have any comment or question? No, no, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Uh, thanks. Okay. Thank you, Prem, for giving such a nice talk. And I think already you are exhausted. It's. Uh, thank you very much for being a patient audience. I. <laughs> no, it's. It's uh, a lot longer than I thought it would be, but. Uh, no, it's it's a really nice talk. So. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, then uh, stay safe and healthy. And uh, this talk will be posted in the QA stream channel and then I will share the link with you. Okay. And uh, yeah, maybe in future with some new idea, you can come up again in our forum. And sure. thanks again for your participation. It mean, means a lot. And I hope this will be helpful for the students, those who have attended and those who have not attended. They can so. see the thing in on online mode. And most importantly, those who are not in the talk and wants to ask questions, they can connect with you. And uh, yeah. please. You're welcome to ask any questions because the talk may have rambled on. Yeah. Please too write, much. To, write to Prem directly. And uh, he will be happy to give the uh, clarification or, of any of your questions. So yeah, so bye. Bye, thanks everyone.